Gracious God, we're thankful for how you call us to be ceaseless, fearless, and relentless. May we embrace those descriptions of the teachings we find in this passage. For your name we pray. Amen. So, Larry, I don't mean to embarrass you, but if, uh, if we ever do a play, you should, not the person, you should have the voice of the high priest, because that really sounded like a con con condemning statement that you made. It had some force to it, so it was good. It was good. So, let me just uh, recount where we've been. Acts 1, okay, it's no quiz. Acts 1, Jesus ascends to heaven, and they replace Judas with another apostle named Matthias. Okay, one out of 200. That's like a 0.5% response rate here. In Acts 2, it's Pentecost. The church is born. In Acts 3, Peter heals a crippled beggar. In Acts 4, Peter and John exercise boldness. Remember that one? Now we're up to chapter 5. Are you on the edge of the pew yet? Okay, just check. Well, the apostles continue to be persecuted. They're doing all this good stuff in the world, but they still get, they get slammed by the religious leaders. They're just not giving the right talking points out to the crowd. They preach and they teach, and they never give up. They never stop. They never cease. They are relentless in their calling. They're fearless, ceaseless, and they are relentless. Now, if you've read through the book of Acts, you'll find that Peter takes on this persona of being like the new Jesus, healing people as he walks the streets. In fact, in the verses not read, there is a reference to people were being carried out into the streets, hoping, praying that the shadow of Peter would touch their bodies and they would be healed. The sick healed. The lame now can walk. Have you ever met someone, or maybe you yourself, shook the hand of a celebrity and then muttered to yourself, I'll never wash my hand again? Young girls fainted and cried as the Beatles crooned on the Ed Sullivan show. Folks line up for hours to see their favorite celebrity, their favorite character in the news. And for some reason, I don't know why, we are enamored with visiting locations we've seen on television. Why, do we, why are we drawn to that? Ad agencies use the line, as seen on TV, to market products and merchandise. Peter's shadow has so much power as the woman yearned to touch the, the robe of Jesus. It's that parallel character that takes place in this book. People are ceaseless in seeking a connection between a person and a possession, no matter how fleeting it might be. When you went through stuff to move to Florida, how tough was it to get rid of some of the things you had? It was tough. We still have boxes of stuff. I have a broken watch from my dad. It's broken. It doesn't tell time. I spent more money to get that thing fixed than what it's worth. Why? Because it's his watch, and I don't know. Throw it into the incinerator when it's my time to go. I don't know. There are pens, pins, knickknacks from generations ago that serve no earthly purpose in our lives other than casting a shadow on our lives. From the people who used them decades ago, those shadows touch us in ways that it brings alive a memory, I guess. Why do we hold on to them? What power, if any, do they hold? They, they don't. I guess there's some strength and sentiment. We yearn to be connected to others in our families, either dead or alive. We crave to be coupled with, to the holy other, even if from a shadow of Peter who walks by. Well, as Larry mentioned, the, the apostles are thrown into prison, it's as if they are reenacting Holy Week with Jesus being tossed in the slammer himself. 
I mean, I've never been in prison for an extended period of time. I mean, I've been there to visit people. And there's some, you know, when you walk into a prison, and you got to empty your pockets, it's like TSA all over again, but a higher level. The door slammed behind you, there's no privacy, there's, it's, it's almost, it, it's indignant. And the very setting alone paints an outlook that is less than encouraging, it's downright oppressing. Peter and the apostle, they, they felt that themselves. During the night, a messenger, an angel of the Lord, opens the prison doors and tells them, go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. What's the message about this life? What do we tell people? You know, so much of Scripture throughout from the Old Testament, it says go. Everyone was told to stow up and stand up and go. Jesus at the end of Matthew says go. And so much of church life is just sitting around waiting for things to happen. Get up and go. Be relentless in teaching is what the angel tells them. You know, I'm fascinated by that instruction by the angel. Tell the people about the whole message of this life. How many of you have ever seen the movie City Slickers? Oh, you're kidding me. Really? Is there cable on the island? I mean, do you have... Anyways. It was a story about two guys, uh, Billy Crystal and I forget the other guy's name. They go from New York City out west for one of those wagon train kind of experiences. And Jack Palance, he, uh, he's out there, you know, old Jack who's now deceased, he's out there, Curly's his name, and he says, I've seen you guys come out here before. You're going through a midlife crisis. Things aren't good in your marriage. Kids are rebelling against you, so you just escape it, and you go out west, then you're going to find what the meaning of life is. He goes, I tell you what the meaning of life is. The meaning of life is one thing. And Crystal says, well, what is it? That's what you've got to find out yourself. Right? What is that secret to the message of life that the angel talks about? The apostles, they figured out that one thing. And that one thing starts with a J. It's called Jesus. And they're relentless. They're ceaseless. They're fearless. They are focused on life. The high priest and Sadducees are focused on jealousy because the apostles' popularity and teachings. The Sadducees and Pharisees had misplaced priorities. They were trying to maintain an institution, maintain their power, maintain their positions in life. The apostles were saying, no, we're going to give life to the people around us. That's why we're teaching, and that's why we're preaching. So often, I think people get turned off with any kind of organization because they focus on the organization and not the person for whom the organization was founded. And notice when the apostles are brought to the authorities, they're not concerned about how they escaped or if they escaped. We gave you strict orders not to teach and preach anymore. That was their focus. Isn't that crazy? And the dust-up encourages a couple stable and tolerant leaders to conclude by saying, well, keep away from these guys and let them alone because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. You ever have somebody who's that voice of wisdom and calm stand up and say, hey, listen, not so fast here. Back in the War College, back in 2013-14, read a book about the Thucydides. It's the uh, Peloponnesian War. And the young guys were anxious to go to war, to dress for battle, and go out and fight for what they believed in. You know who stood up and said, listen, whoa, back off a little bit. It was the older men who had been through war, who know what it's like. They said, not so fast. Let's try to find another way to solve this problem, a voice of reason. The church needs to be that voice of reason, that voice of stability, that voice of hope in a world that's just going to, it's unraveling like we can't believe. I got an amen corner over here. <laughs> Jackie Kay, good to see you. We get an impression from these from Peter and the Apostle, unbridled passion, life-giving message to the masses. 
have we lost that passion in our lives today? The apostles, they're teaching, preaching, converting thousands upon thousands from a Jewish understanding of God to a Jewish Christian understanding through Christ. And their work, <laughs> it's intimidating. People get jealous of others who are very successful in their line of work. So what do you think clergy talk about when they get together for lunch? You know one of the first questions is? How many members do you have? What's your attendance? And the big question, what's your budget? What's your package? That's what people talk about. We get jealous and we don't focus on building the kingdom. The teachings are liberating spirits chained to old ways, opening minds that have been closed to the winds of a new spirit, and unleashing joy that has been measured and meted like links in a chain. Divorce is not normal in my family. It just isn't. I was raised in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, a very conservative area. So conservative, we dressed up as Democrats at Halloween. That's how conservative that whole thing was. <laughs> and I had a very strong Anabaptist tradition where you had, you know, it was believer's baptism. Firm family values were just woven into the culture. You, you didn't work on Sundays unless you had to. And when I was growing up, it was the blue laws. Things were closed. And as one of five children, I was the first to get divorced. Divorce, as some of you might know, is not for the faint of heart. It's just not. It's emotional. It's expensive. And it's not exactly a job magnet when you're trying to find a church to serve. Well, upon divorcing, my adult kids naturally came to the defense of their mom, and I understand that. And we worked through some tough times, and eventually, years later, one of my kids, I think speaking on behalf of the other two, said, Dad, we've never seen you happier, and we've never seen Mom happier. Life is challenging and difficult. It's joyous and depressing. It is a true cocktail of emotions. It just is. But we need to be ceaseless and fearless and relentless in following our understanding of how God changes lives in the midst of turmoil, taking us through some fires we never expected to walk through, and we get to the other side. In action, in the face of real living, is nothing more than an emotional prison. Now, I would ask that when you go home today to your spouse, don't say, I heard a great sermon today. I can now get divorced. The lawyer's calling tomorrow. <laughs> don't do that. As people of the Christian faith, we're here to tell the whole message about this life. God loves us. God forgives us. God redeems us. God wants to live our lives to the fullest fulfillment we can possibly imagine. God's relentless. God is searless. God, God is relentless in searching for us and finding us. God has left the other 99, and he has come to find us. We are given new life through Christ. Our allegiance needs to be something greater than what we perceive in this world. Our allegiance to God through Christ calls us to live a full and fruitful life. And when we're timid about that, we miss out on such incredible opportunities that we face. Back in the Army, as chaplains, we would lead these weekend retreats called Strong Bonds events. They were meant to strengthen relationships between families and couples. And one of them was called How to Laugh Your Way to a Happy Marriage. It was a great program. And then the one for single soldiers was How Not to Marry a Jerk. It was a great program. <laughs> but they all began with this. Imagine you're sitting on a rocking chair in the front porch of your home. You're retired. You're reliving your life in your mind. What are your regrets? What are some things you wish you had done? Remember the old 
philosophical question, is it better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all? No. In terms of faith, is it better to have lived and lost than to have never lived at all? We underestimate the powerful presence and support of God and friends as we navigate twists and turns of life. I want to close with the story of an army chaplain. In fact, he was there in D-Day. Father Ignatius Martinowski, Polish. He was relentless. He was fearless. He was ceaseless in caring for the people God entrusted to him. There was massive carnage on D-Day. And the only U.S. military chaplain killed on D-Day was this guy, Father Ignatius Martinowski. He's a Catholic priest. 32 years old. He parachuted in with the 82nd Airborne Division. He was a priest you didn't want to mess with. One said he was a tough and energetic person. He was extremely liked by men of his regiment. He was a man's man. Chaplains didn't have to get into the front lines where there was combat, but these guys refused to stay back. They would go up to the front, and he did. He didn't find it amusing when men were telling filthy jokes, speaking crudely, or taking the Lord's name in vain. More than one time, he would say, put on boxing gloves to anyone who made remarks about the church or confession. He'll take it down. Martinowski, a U.S. Army captain, was a paratrooper. He landed. And the regiment's website recalls that the paratroopers landed near a small village in Pickleville, where the only store, a grocery store, was turned into a makeshift first aid station for the wounded paratroopers. It was overcrowded. They could not fit all the wounded in there. Martinowski made a risky move. He went across enemy lines to meet with the Germans. He met with the German chief medic in charge of their wounded. And he negotiated combining all of the wounded into one large place that they could share to take care of those who were hurt. And with his religious insignia on his jacket, wearing a red, ba red cross band on his arm, he removed his helmet and he walked back and forth to make sure that people were cared for. He was relentless. He was ceaseless. He was fearless. Why? Because of his faith. Because he cared about humanity. He cared about no matter what their nationality was to make sure they were cared for. And so he returned to the makeshift stage station with the same German medic to show him the conditions, and they did. And this one time he returned alone, shot in the back, and dead. Ceaseless. Fearless. Relentless. That's a shadow I want to have touch me. Amen.